Hey, it's Andrew, and I want to take a minute to tell you about the Podcast Panacea. If you want to create a podcast or already have one that could use a little TLC, the Podcast Panacea is for you. Are you about to make a purchase on expensive studio equipment? Stop. Save your money. The Podcast Panacea will teach you how to sound professional and interview anyone from anywhere with the most secret tricks of the trade. Email info at podcastpanacea.com or go to podcastpanacea.com to learn more. You can also find the link in our show notes. The Podcast Panacea is the cure-all for your podcast. If in my high moments I have done some good, offered some service, shared some light, Heal some wounds, rekindle some hope, or stir some wrong of apathy and indifference, or in any way along the way help somebody, then this campaign has not been in vain. With your host, Andrew Gordon. Tonya Nayas, am I saying that correctly? Almost. <laughs> Tonya or Tonya in Norwegian. Tonya, I love it, okay. And last name is Ness. Welcome to the Yoga Moves You podcast. And I'm guessing you're speaking to me from Norway right now? No, I'm in Mexico actually. Mexico? Boy, was I confused. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on in Mexico? Are you on a retreat? Uh, no, I live here uh, now for parts of the year with my boyfriend, who is Mexican. It's a good time of the year to live there. When it gets to maybe July and August, you head back to Norway? Yeah, I'm going back in the end of May, actually. Wow, you have a very interesting story, so I'm going to have to try and dig into this uh, bit by bit. Or, uh, I'm sorry, poco a poco. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but you grew up in Norway, correct? Yes, that's right. <laughs> where, where exactly? In Oslo, the capital. Yes. Or right outside, like in the suburb. I'm assuming it was a lot cooler all year round in Norway. So what were you like growing up? What kind of things were you into? Were you a skier? Uh, yeah, I think every Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. They, they strap them on before baby shoes. Yeah, they say that Norwegians are born with skis on their feet. I believe it. I believe it. Do you always have a nice amount of snowfall all year round? No. Um, usually, like from November until March, April, uh, there can be snow, but more so like further north or in the mountain areas. City, like in Oslo, it can often be like just like rainy and yeah, not not good. But but you do have all four seasons. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So besides skiing, were there any other physical activities or things you were into that? kind of stuck with you throughout the uh, elementary into your more formative years as a young adult? Like I was doing uh, like cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, like dancing, never anything that included a ball because like I'm no good with that. <laughs> the exact opposite of, of everything I would think of when I think of activities and sports. You named two activities that involved skis and I'm thinking like Skiing itself is just one whole thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's my ignorance. So there you go. You go through high school. Were you a very social person or you were more a homebody or into your own thing, a loner? No, I would say I was pretty social. I think I'm more introspective now than I was back then. Than I was, yeah, with my friends all the time, I think. Do you think that eventually your path in yoga helped you get to light? that way or it happened maybe when you went away for a school oh uh, definitely uh, the yoga it makes you more comfortable i guess uh, being with yourself <laughs> absolutely absolutely i'm gonna travel down memory lane with you going back to the uh about early 2000s and you went to business school norwegian business school and you got your bachelor degree in retail management. So what made you want to go into business school? Um, that was because of our family business. Actually, my dad uh, used to have, he sold it, so it's not there anymore. So that's what made me, me interested. Um, 
it was a business that had been started by my great grandfather. Like my grandfather had it and my dad. And I was thinking that maybe I wanted to, you know, take it over at some point. Uh, but then he decided to to sell, which was a good thing because I don't think I would have. <laughs> what kind of business was it? Hardware and tools. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you would be all enthusiastic about hardware and tools. I don't get it. Why you would not want to carry the torch? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but y- you did have a pretty enthusiastic drive towards business, or you were really making your dad believe that uh, because you continued on after 2008 (laughs) to do more business school and graduate in 2010 still from Norwegian business school this time with some supplementary courses in marketing and management and you also did this special event which now I see you're kind of like on this left turn you made with sustainable tourism yeah can you talk a little bit more about that project because I feel like that that may have been a turning point for you well Actually, uh, my my turning point came with my, I don't know if I'm allowed to jump there yet, but with my master's thesis. Oh, no, it's okay. I was going to jump to the University of, of Paul César next. <laughs> and uh, je, je parle français aussi. I don't, I don't speak Norwegian now, unfortunately. But yeah, so your turning point came there. And from there, in uh, 2011, you studied your master's in management. And... What happened during that time where your your turning point eventually hit you there? But I can say, like, as, as you obviously see, like, I was studying for a long time business, like seven years. Yeah. And things like I like to learn. Uh, I could probably find pretty much anything interesting once I, like, get deeper into it. So that that's what kept me there so long. I'm like, oh, this is interesting, you know? So I just, like, kept going deeper. Yes. But when I started to write my, my master's thesis, I was... Uh, just planning to write about the the oil industry because I was doing uh, uh, my master's in international management, right? And the oil industry is such an international business. So I was like, okay, they probably have some interesting business models or whatever. Yeah. Um, but then I found we, we have to find our own uh, supervisor for the master's thesis. And I was going to this guy who's a professor in put- petroleum economics and I had my suggestions and then he says no that's like completely uninteresting I only want to be your mentor if you go and write about um, like how the oil companies portray themselves as kind of like environmental friendly uh, (laughs) (laughs) which has become a, a trend and compare that to where they actually place their money and I want you to take mm. the 10, 10 biggest oil companies, like private oil companies in the world. Yeah. And over the past uh, 10 years and like look at like their, what they are telling the world upwards and where they're actually doing their investments. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it was very interesting. And it was like a huge eye opener to me uh, into this world of just like lies and corruption. I love the title of it. Green words and black money. Yeah. What was one of the most shocking things that you found? I don't know. Like up until that point, I haven't like really been engaging that much in, uh, I don't know, like, of course, like you hear about the global warming and like all these things, but like, I wasn't like super like into it um, yeah. at that point. Uh, and Norway is a, a country that is, it's very rich because of oil. Mm-hmm. Right, and so they never really talk bad about it. Uh, yeah. Now they do, but back then not so much. Um, and uh, you believe like we're you were led to believe that, like we're such a nice country, you know, and like yeah, we're into oil, but we're doing it the nice way. <laughs> and yeah, if it's possible to do oil in a nice way, like super naive, right? Yeah. I start to see all these reports, and I'm just like. Like, oh my God, like I had no idea how dirty this business is. Uh, and so after writing my, my thesis, I, I didn't want to work for any huge corporation anymore. I yeah, like, I could see how that could oh. affect you. Yeah, I was like, they are, they are not doing things the right way. <laughs> Can I ask you a question since, since you dug so deep into this topic, which I had no idea, but I came across this the other day where 
the term fossil fuel, and you could maybe you can confirm this or not, that it, it was made up. It's a made up term and that it's not a real concept that it was created by Rockefeller so that we would believe there was a lack of this oil and that it would run out someday because it's a fossil fuel which came from fossils in the grounds, from, which is not accurate according to what I was listening to. Hmm. No, I don't know uh, about that actually. Um, but I know at least my, my supervisor said that the, the problem is not if there's enough oil because there's more than enough to ruin the world. You know? so yeah. You need to come up with another solution before, before that, long before that. Right, but if you, if you create a perception of lack, then you can yeah. keep the price up. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> so, yeah, good people, good people. Uh, <laughs> then you, you moved into a lecturer position. So I guess that was like this transition away from straight up corporate because uh, it was a temporary position, but you were a lecturer. So some sort of yeah. educational position. What were you doing with that? Uh, I was at that point, I was thinking that maybe I wanted to be a teacher um, because I, I like to teach and like all through my studies, like my, uh, my fellow students like when we're studying together like they would often tell me oh you're really good at explaining things yes uh, and I, I liked it too so I thought oh you know teaching it's always there's something I always wanted to do so I was looking into that and I took this temporary position at a high school um was discovering that these people were not very interested in listening to me <laughs> <laughs> I can relate I'm a former teacher myself Oh, yeah. Good intentions we all go in with. Uh, so I'm very, very happy that I took that temporary position before like, I started to go like, even further down that road because I was like, mm, no, like, I like to teach to people who actually want to like, listen to what I have to say. So Yes. It, it's not it. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're going into um, middle school, high school, even it depends, I guess, uh, elementary school. But yeah, that was always a frustrating thing. The, the beautiful thing is when you, what, you were teaching, you said, in high school, right? Yeah. Yeah, see, I was teaching eventually. I mean, I taught the middle school thing and, and some high school and elementary. Eventually, I was at a paid-for school, for-profit. So, you know, they were paying to be there. So basically, I would say, if you don't want to be here, you can go. That's the best thing to be able to say, in my mind. If you're not interested, just go. See ya. I guess after that, you're like, what do I do? You hit that brick wall and maybe it's a brick wall, but at the same time, it's, it's a, an awakening to all these doors of possibility. Yeah. So what happens next? I start to work in, I guess, a major corporation, like the bank where yes. I had most of my summer internships. I'm, I'm very miserable. <laughs> I yeah, so you, you worked there a long time. You were there for nine months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my friend, she said to me, she's like, Tanya, like, if you hate this job so much and you do talk about yoga all the time, like, why don't you just start a yoga business instead? And I yes. thought, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go and do that. When did you start practicing? When I was 18. Okay, so you've been a yogi all throughout your business school, yeah. you, you know, yeah. your seven years of college and, and beyond. So it, it made sense. It wasn't like you just said, oh, yoga's cool. Yeah, I like it. I'm going <laughs> to go to train as a teacher. No, you were practicing since you're 18. So you, you were legit. Where did you do your training at? Uh, I did my first training in, uh, in Thailand at Absolute Yoga Academy. Hmm. And after that, did you go right into being a teacher? Uh, I did. And were, were you traveling as a teacher or did you go back to, to Norway to teach? No, there was, it, it was a lot of things happening at, at, at that time. First, my friend said that to me. And then I thought, okay, if I'm going to have a yoga business, I need to be a teacher. So I found this teacher training. And after I had signed up for it, I um, randomly met the girl who were to become my business partner. Uh, she had just moved to Norway. Um, she's American, but her dad's Norwegian. And she had just moved to Norway. Uh, she was reaching out to me through 
Twitter <laughs> of all channels and say, hey, <laughs> I see you live in Oslo as well and that you do yoga. Would you like to meet? Because she didn't know anyone. So she was trying to make some friends. And I yeah. thought, oh, yeah, why not? And we start to talk and she's ju just done with her uh, teacher training and she wants to open a yoga studio. And I said, oh, I want to open a yoga studio too. And we're talking and we have all the same ideas. So we agree that when I come back from my teacher training a couple of months later, we will go for our yoga studio. Yeah. Uh, so th that's what we did. That's very cool. And then you opened up and that is Lila Yoga? Yeah, Lila Yoga. Yeah. And that's in Oslo. And yeah. you have a lot going on there. So <laughs> you, it, it, you list vinyasa and yin, which makes sense. Yoga Nidra, meditation, but also this is actually trademarked you ha unless you just put that on you know you we can all do control or command g and make the registered trademark sign but i believe yours is actually probably registered yoga astrology what's that all about yes uh that's um a training i did i did later on with a wonderful woman uh her name is diane and she's located in the states actually hmm. and uh i started uh to teach this the yoga astrology that combines yoga uh, with astrology right uh, the cycles of the sun and the moon and uh, at this point i also do mentoring of that year-long program and i also do this initiation weekend trainings uh, for teachers in this uh, special field yoga astrology so, so what happens i mean i know like of course, from the name, it combines yoga and astrology, but can you just shed a little bit more light on maybe some of the nuances of the blending of those two? Like what many people don't know is that like all the uh, 12 signs of the zodiac, they're also uh, connected or like correlated to uh, diff our different body parts with like areas being the first sign of the zodiac is connected to the head. Uh, hmm. And then Taurus being the second is connect uh, as a connection to the the throat and like and so on and so forth. It's like Pisces being the last one and being connected to our feet. So you can kind of like draw inspiration there. And like when the sun right now the sun is in Taurus, right? Yeah. So like when when the that month that the sun is in Taurus, the energy of Taurus. Um, applies to all of us it's not only people who is born in the sign of taurus but that's like the collective okay. energy and uh, so you can work with all of that energy in the yoga practice like you can work with poses that are you know uh, good for uh, the neck um and taurus is an earth sign so you can work on like grounding right uh, so you can like draw on all this element as you create uh your yoga classes I'm a cancer. What body part do I connect with? Is it the belly? No, <laughs> it's the chest. Okay, so maybe uh, warrior sequences? Yeah, why not? Heart openers. <laughs> Heart openers, yes. Yeah. I love it. I love it. This is a great thing. And you, you also teach two year-long online programs, an inner quest to your soul. So this yeah. focuses on earth-based religions. What, what's an example of an earth-based religion? Um, the one I, I draw on, on two, the... Mm -hmm. And that's the well, like shamanic practices okay. from the Andes or the Quero shamans. Okay. And and they don't call they don't call themselves shamans though. They're like they're healers or yeah. Have uh, you have you taken ayahuasca? Yes, I have. <laughs> oh, okay. That's good. What was it like the first time you did it? It's not pleasant. <laughs> Why isn't it pleasant? I heard it's, I'm asking for real because I just yeah. saw a video on it and I'm fascinated. And now I get to speak to someone who actually went through an experience with it. I assume that you did it led with a guide. Um, yeah. I would emphasize that, that who you have, you have as a guide is really, really important because yeah. it's not just the plant. It's also the person guiding the energy of the plant. Yes. And too many um, people are holding ceremonies without the legit experience in my opinion yes uh, so if i if i for everyone who ever wants to do it like really truly look into who's holding the ceremony i did it with a beautiful ayahuasca um, or ayahuasca a female and she's like a great space holder she's been um living in the in the amazon in the rainforest since she was little 
doing holding ayahuasca ceremony since he was 12 years old um and truly beautiful woman super caring um so that so that that was a ama- that was an amazing experience um and so so before we get to the bad experience since we're on the <laughs> the, the, the very good one what what are the positive benefits of going through an ayahuasca experience with a proper person guiding you? What did you come to arrive to through that experience? I'd say clarity. Um, mm. Is that what most people are looking for? Um, but but also, how should I put this? Uh, like at the point when I I started to dig in uh to the more like earth-based religions like i had done so many years of in the work so i believe that like my uh ayahuasca experience is like not as bad as it can be for many people who has a lot of shit to deal with yeah. <laughs> at the point they're doing it yeah um, yeah because yeah. what she does or the medicine what she does is making you face all your demons right and that's what makes it not so pleasant yeah yeah uh, you have to see like your shadow self mm-hmm. in the eyes and deal with it. Um, so uh, that's, she's very dark, you know, she's connected to the earth, to the night. It's always done during the night. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's dark. It's kind of like going to that darkness of your soul. Um, yeah. I've done acid. Yeah. And that, that's different. Like I haven't done acid, but like from what I, uh, <laughs> from, from, from what I hear that that's, it's, it's, I feel like it's lighter. Like it's more like it connects you to, I don't know, the universe or whatever. Yeah. No, I, again though, but I didn't have a guide, but if I, if I were with the wrong people, mm-hmm. you know, the energy could shift to, to mm-hmm. take you into a, a not so great place. But fortunately yeah. I never had a bad trip. But yeah, there are other planes and, and dimensions that we could enter into for sure. I, I know they're there. I don't really want to go back to them anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years ago uh, and lifetimes ago. But I definitely can relate. And that's why I'm curious about ayahuasca. The not so good experience was the person just kind no. of not compassionate as a guide. No, no, same, same lady. It's more oh. that, that that whole. <laughs> it's more that whole experience of of uh, facing things you don't want to face. Yeah. Yeah. It's not for everybody. Uh, no, probably not. <laughs> yeah. 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 But also, I want to say, like, I had been very, very scared of ayahuasca for many, many years, and one of my major realization was that life or the universe or whatever you want to call it had sure. given way harder lesson than ayahuasca ever did <laughs> really yeah so i have been trying to avoid avoid it and i had you know just getting like slaps my slaps in the face <laughs> yes either, either way so so this leads me to coming through that experience um you also are certified in reiki and yeah. of course we touched on astrology and the earth-based yep. religions. But yep. last but not least, you are a Mesa carrier. So you are an initiated shaman. Yes. And so tell me a little bit more about that, how you got it, what the initiation is like and what you do as a shaman. I mean, there's so many things you can you can do. Or, you know, as like yeah. some people will be Ayascaros or Ayascaros, like, and they will work with the master of pan medicine. Like I don't do uh, anything like that. Like I plants are not my special field at all but i do energy healing and the type of energy healing you do there is you have you know what a mesa is the the clock Uh, it's a clock okay yeah it's an altar so it's kind of like an altar you carry with you so the mesa is a a mesa like a cloth and inside this um, cloth you carry your your kuyas or stones uh, and it's 13 of them 12 of them i have picked myself and one of them is called a lineage stone and it has the blood of the lineage you're initiated into on it mm. and then every single of these kuyas they symbolizes a wound or a trauma that i have been working through wow um so that's kind of like your initiation process in addition to several ceremonies that you you go through um 
That is very deep. So you, you do a lot of this. Obviously, you're not going to bring someone through a, an ayahuasca experience or work with people, uh, energy healing online, I imagine. But you do other stuff online, including the fact that you have your own studios in Norway. But you do this year-long program called an inner quest to your soul. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So that's the thing. The healings you can do online. You can do or you can do it. You don't have to be online while you do it, but you can do them long distance. Okay. Um, since everything is energy and everything is connected, it's, you don't really have to be next to the person to perform a healing on them. So, and that's part of that online, maybe not so much a training as it's a one year of healing every month. Like we go, the year long program is uh, working through these four archetypes of the Quiero or the Andean medicine wheel. Um, and each archetype, it's the serpent, the jaguar, the hummingbird, and the eagle. They represent uh, different layers and, and different healings. So we, in this year, we're spending three months working with each archetype. So wow. they get t- teachings and assignments every month uh, in their inbox. And then we do one hour of energy healing and one hour of coaching every month. And there's also different energy healing um, connected to the different archetypes. So like in serpent, you work more like chakra balancing and illumination. Yes. Um, the jaguar would be more extractions. Uh, hummingbird is soul retrieval. And during eagle, you will do like a death rite. So you're dying and being reborn, uh, transcending that all version of you. Wow. That's very deep. Where yeah. are, these, are, these, are these people worldwide since it is online? And, and how do you find these people for a program like this? Uh, all day, I have a program starting up now in June on the summer solstice. Uh, mm-hmm. And I do a maximum of 13 people because it's, it is deep and it's pretty intense, right? So you want to be able to give everyone the intention they des- uh, attention they deserve. Yes. Uh, we're not, right now, I have 10 10 people, and I say half of them are people who have done my yoga astrology initiation training, okay. yes. um, and the rest is more like random people that like follow me on Instagram and yeah, just are curious and want to sign up. Yeah, no, that's cool. I was just wondering because I know it's online, so you, it, and I'm more interested in the mix of people you get, you know, because when it's worldwide, you have a lot of different, uh, if you're excavating and you're, uh, digging in to uncover people's stuff yeah (laughs) depending on where they grew up and what their life is about and uh that plays into it you know people's situation so you might have a very interesting mix of people so i find that fascinating now you you, you like have done it all i don't know so in 2015 (laughs) you continued let's go back to yoga for a second yeah (laughs) and you got your um RYS 1000, so the yoga lines thing for a thousand. Uh, I feel like I'll, I'll take yoga lines for a thousand. <laughs> On Jeopardy. Okay, uh, you did the yoga, the medicine with Tiffany Crookshank. Can you talk a little bit more about that? She's really cool. I actually messaged her once and she wrote back, which was way early in my career, even before I had a podcast. And I thought that was really sweet of her. She had visited a local studio and I was like, man, I'm so sorry. I missed it. I, want, I really wanted to go. And I was like, oh, that's cool. She actually had the humility and, and um, kindness and compassion to write back and say, yeah, maybe I'll be back there some, some other time. So I've only heard good things about her. Yeah, she's super sweet, super sweet. And what's the yoga medicine program all about? I mean, besides medicine and yoga. It's very uh, anatomy based. Okay. She's, yeah, she's... Uh, super, super knowledgeable when it comes to anatomy. Uh, so it's kind of like using yoga uh, as medicine, more like physical, not so much, not so much spiritual or um, anything like that. I started that because I like when I teach to keep people safe, right? Yes. And I also like yes. to be able to answer, answer people's questions when they come and say, oh, I hurt here or I have this injury or whatever it might be, like, how can yoga help and yeah, I very much like to have, have an answer. So, so that's pretty much why I, I dived into that. 
Uh, now, I'm just curious, what's her background in anatomy? Because I know when she first went to California, she was there to be an actress. Oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. No, she's not very personal. She doesn't share much about herself except what she teaches. Well, yeah, I would, if I had a yoga medicine program, I wouldn't be like, I, before I got into yoga, I was just out in California hanging out to be an actress. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably I, I keep, not. <laughs> I would keep that quiet. But that being said, um, you know, all jokes aside, I do respect her. And, and I know that you can always change and learn um, as you go yeah. along, for sure. So yeah. I just threw she it out there. She knows a lot. Of, yeah, she's amazing with anatomy. Yeah. Now, does she want to take her program and make it in – part of the IAYT, the International Association of Yoga Therapists. I know they're trying hard to get their thing recognized uh, as a certification. I don't know, actually. Uh, I haven't been with her in a, a while. Like okay. I got, like after my last module in, that was in the meditation in Thailand, I guess that about two years ago, uh, I just, I needed more spirituality in my practice so like I then I started to dive into like a whole other <laughs> so I you know the laws are different no matter what country you're in um as far as health insurance in America they don't accept yoga yet I think they should but you know that's a fight mm. that's going to take some time what, what yeah. is it like in Norway so if you're a yoga therapist is this something that's recognized? Yoga in Norway is still not as acknowledged as it is in the States or in England, Australia, places like that. Uh, that's one of the things that made my studio quite successful, I think, because we started at the right time. Not many people. Uh, yeah, uh, 2013. Just, and you've been a yeah. business. Congratulations, because you've been in business for over five years. And I mean... That's an accomplishment. I'm a former studio owner. It's not easy. Uh, yeah, we're having our five-year anniversary party now in June when I get back. <laughs> that is so cool. So tell me a little bit more about Lila Yoga in Oslo. Uh, what kind of classes do you have in a schedule? Maybe how many classes a week? How many teachers? Like what kind of – is it a gigantic studio, a, a smaller one, more intimate? Do you want to open up more locations? What happens there? Um, <laughs> it is uh, – <laughs> It's only one yoga shala, uh, okay. so it's uh, it's quite uh, intimate. So I would yes. say maybe we can have yeah twenty uh, twenty people uh, at cool. once. We also have a little store uh, and a little cafe and uh, like a cute lounge area where people can hang out. Um, have about twelve teachers, I think. And do you have a full staff or just a, enough people to run the front desk and things and operations so that you don't have to really. Yeah. Just do enough. It? It's uh, yeah. Just enough people to do like the day-to-day -day management. Yes. Uh, you, need, you, need, you need that to actually yeah. be, be happy. <laughs> and then like the teachers are just coming in for their, their classes when they teach. Yes. Um, but yeah, they're all s super sweet uh, bunch of people. Um, and then most of them have been there almost from the beginning, like been there for many years, which is really nice. That says a lot about your studio. It really does because that's rare. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just like thinking about it. Like, yeah, they're all been there for like a long time. <laughs> Are there uh, other studios in the area? Because I know you said that yours was one of the first ones, you know, to really jump on yoga at the time. But was... yeah, I would say that when we started, it was just, about like maybe one other like same size studio but they're more ashtanga based and okay. we we were more bringing in that which i would actually call like an american model where you you have a membership and you can go to as many classes as you want and it's like yeah. lots of different different classes to pick from uh, and no one had done that in norway yet at that yeah. time um so that became very popular uh but now I guess maybe the past two years or maybe it's even three uh like our main like fitness chain they also opened a yoga studio which is car of course is like super big and super fancy yeah that's what it's like here i mean well I, i'm open studios in charlotte north carolina area and you have the gyms offering yoga as part of the membership you have the ymcas which are just a public thing you know you, you heard the song ymca yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> 
<laughs> and then you have like people, I'm being for real, like in their neighborhoods offering yoga for free just to the people who live in their neighborhoods in the clubhouse on the weekend. So it's like, what do you do? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> what do you do is like the little boutique studio. It's like almost impossible. So I hope that doesn't happen to, you know, I know there's one place where that opened up. That's a major chain by you, but you know what? It sounds like because you have your footing there for the last five years that you have your community, you have your Sangha and you know, that means something in the end for the people that really are true to, to this. Yeah. Um, you know, so that will always hold, hold strong, I believe. I really um, hope so. Um, we're also doing a, um, the, uh, my, my business partner over the past five years, she has decided to sell out. Uh, Ooh, okay. Yeah. And my sister is uh, taking over. So that's oh, exciting okay. as well. Yeah. Yeah, that is cool. That is cool. That yeah. will be a different change of energy uh, and maybe one yeah. that, is, that is needed both for your partner and for you. Who knows? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm very excited about that to see, see where that is going. What would you say has been the biggest joy and the biggest challenge of owning a studio? Because it's something that a lot of people listening actually can relate to. We do have a, a good deal of people who are studio owners that I, I know I've checked in and listened because I happen to have ha- had been one myself. So that there's a connection there. To me, I guess the biggest joy is just getting to teach. Like, I really love teaching. Yeah. Um. Like I can have the worst day ever and I go in and teach and I feel great. It's like, for me, it's like going to a class. I feel amazing yeah. afterwards. Yeah, that's um, cool. I, I understand that. That's awesome. Uh, the biggest challenge is had or was when I was working more full time at the studio, uh, doing all the admin work. Yeah. More, more and more realized that I teach yoga because I, or like I have a studio because I want to teach yoga. Uh, and that's what I'm passionate about, like not answering emails and, and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I understand. Very, yeah. very uh, intimately, I understand. Yeah. So la- last but not least, I mean, we've covered so much with your offerings in terms of online and in the studio. Are you planning on offering yoga on skis? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because when you think about it, he, in America they have the stand-up paddleboard yoga, which is oh yeah, who That's even knows? Hard. I try that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even sure the logic behind that, but hey, you know what? It's, no, they have. Did you know that they have goat yoga in America? that's that's ridiculous <laughs> I, i'm not lying to you so the first thing was like the beer and yoga and then all of a sudden they said let's bring baby goats and have people come to a farm and they'll bring like little not, not big goats but little goats and that was a thing i don't know if it's still a thing but i always wonder like why is it yoga that gets the beer mixed with it and like the goats and the cats like you don't see pilates like in crossfit and uh you know, no one's bringing in cattle and skiing, <laughs> you know, like why, why is it just yoga? I, That's very true. I wonder sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> but back to the business side for a second, you do have a company that you own, I believe called Tanya Ness Holding, which I said your oh, name yeah. wrong probably again, but you have a company for the last four years about in Oslo and you deal with national international investments and obligation shares. <laughs> and hedge fund so i've never met a yogi and a shaman who has a hedge fund oh my god surprise <laughs> like you've done your research well now don't be doing some voodoo shit on me because i did my research <laughs> um no this is uh, really uh, <laughs> This comes from um, my my dad selling his company. <laughs> okay. Business. Yes. So when the family business was sold, uh, he divided um, the the what do you call it the profit? Yes. The, yeah. The dividends yeah. or the profits. Yeah. You know. You know about it. Don't act like you don't know what this. You know. You know what everything's called. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That was more like the English word for it. Sometimes I don't. I don't find the the right word, um, but yeah, he was uh, dividing that, uh, and twenty five percent was mine, and he put that into uh, or the lawyers, I guess, everything they put that into a holding company uh, because it has to be put somewhere. I get it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it has to be put, put somewhere. And then my dad, he's had his investors for 
uh, that he's spent or used his whole life. So it's the same uh, investors who are investing from my uh, holding company. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I had... So it's not me. <laughs> I just had to ask you about it in case, you know, you ever want to hedge some of that funds as a sponsor of this podcast, you know, I'm just, <laughs> since I'm such a good researcher. <laughs> All right. So, so it's very much just, I was, a, I, I will not say just because it also allow, allows me to, to live uh, my life very like freely as I like and actually do the things I love without worrying too much about having to make that much money off of the things I love, right? Which no, it's a beautiful, th great, it's a beautiful thing. Idea. And you're yeah. using, you know, look, there's, a, there's other people that have a position like that you have and may not be doing as giving and good things in the world. Like you have this freedom, but you're using it to actually help people. So that's a beautiful thing, you know? It's not like, so I always, I always, when I read about money and the, and the topic of it, people say, you know, money doesn't really make you happy. It, it magnifies more of who you are. So if you're generally an asshole, you become more of an asshole. If you're a good person, you have the ability to magnify your goodness and, and, and all that you are that is positive. I like that. Yeah. And I think that's what you're doing, you know, from, from me really looking at, you know, all the things that you're into and all that you're sharing, not just with your studio <laughs> online in Mexico. Who knows? I don't know. Who's this guy in Mexico? Is, you know, you have a hedge fund and I just let something out of the bag? Yeah, I think I mentioned it. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> if you don't want him to know, I'll cut it out of the interview. No, he knows. He knows. What's going <laughs> Mila, what's going on over there? <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm gonna stop it tanya Ness, it's been a pleasure to have you on the yoga Musu podcast and i promise to promote all of your offerings in the show Thank notes you. and if you could find it in your in your time to cross promote the interview when it comes out i will contact you and i would truly appreciate it of course of course i will all right thank, thank you. you so much and i hope you enjoy the rest of your time in mexico and the rest of your day Thank you. You too. Thank you, Tanya. Miami. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>